I know it's only been three games, but based on everything we've seen up to this point, this Notre Dame team has a chance to be something special this season, and one former Irish captain believes they have what it takes to be great. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Irish, your daily Notre Dame podcast. Today is Thursday, September 14th, and I'm your host, Tyler Wojak. I'm a Notre Dame alum and producer covering college football for Fox Sports. And thank you for making Locked On Irish your first listen of the day. Today's episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. Empower yourself when you purchase a Jace case, providing you with a personal supply of five antibiotics that treat 50 or more infections. Get yours today at jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. And we got former Notre Dame wide receiver and captain Chris Fink back on the show today to talk about the Irish and why he sees some similarities between this Notre Dame team and the one that made the college football playoff back in 2018. He also shares some great insight about Chris Tyree's transition to wide receiver and Jaden Greathouse's potential. Before we spotlight some of the unsung heroes that don't always get the credit that they deserve but are crucial to the success of this team. I really enjoy this one. I hope you will too. So let's bring him in. All right, I'm joined now by former Notre Dame wide receiver Chris Fink, who is actually one of the very first guests on this show way back in March. So first of all, welcome back. This time around, though, we have actual football to talk about. So let's start with a big picture question. What are your overall impressions of this Notre Dame team through the first three games of the season? First of all, thanks for having me back on, Tyler. It's always fun. Um, Yeah, I'm excited about the team. I think a lot of people are, um, you know, granted, it's only three weeks in. Um, haven't played our, our big opponents yet, you know, got, got a tough schedule coming up, but, um, we're doing the things we're supposed to do in, you know, beating the brakes off of lesser opponents. So I think that's fun. It's exciting. Um, there's a lot of things to, to be happy about. The offense is fun to watch. Defense is good. Um, I think there's kind of like a feeling in the air about the team. I don't, you know, I don't want to jinx it. Um, I'm not on the team anymore, so I can't, you know. I can say these things, but it does yeah. feel it does feel like it has the opportunity to be a special season. A big reason for that is the quarterback, Sam Hartman. He dominated the headlines all offseason, but he certainly backed it up with his play on the field. What do you think are the most impressive parts uh, of his game from what you've seen so far? Yeah, he's he's really good. He's kind of like that missing piece for the team this year. Um, he's so good at Wake Forest, so I, I was excited that he was coming to Notre Dame, and um, it's looking great now. But – uh I think one thing that he does really well is, and this comes, I think, from the way they used to run plays at Wake Forest where he would have that um, – hold that mesh with the running back for a really long time um, and either hand it off or pull it and, like, throw a bomb. Um, just from holding that mesh a long time allows the defense to close in on him. And so he's really good in standing under pressure and, like, taking a hit to the chin and still throwing it and, like, really not getting panicked when, when people are closing in on him. and. Our offensive line is doing a really good job of making sure that doesn't happen often, but when it does, he, he remains composed back there. Yeah, and he's also able to see the entire field despite the pressure, and he's been able to distribute the ball a lot, and Notre Dame has a lot of playmakers to throw to. But having a great quarterback, it is crucial in modern college football, but you need more than just that to compete for the college football playoff. You know that firsthand because you are part of some really great teams at Notre Dame, like the one that went undefeated in the regular season in 2018, and some – not so great teams like in 2016, but from your experience, what are the most important qualities in a team that separates them from just being a good team to a great team and one of the best in the sport? Yeah, I think, uh, I think there's a lot of things that go into it. I can only speak for my experience and, you know, the 2018, 2018 team was really good. We went to the playoffs and, you know, lost pretty badly in the semifinals. So whether you can, call that a great team or not. I'm not sure. Cause obviously at Notre Dame, the only goal is to win the national championship and we fell short of that, but um, definitely a lot better team than we had in 2016 when we went four and eight. Um, and I think the main difference there, and this came from uh, our change in training in the off season with coach Bayless when we brought him in, he kind of um, beat this idea into our mind, which was uh, responding to adversity. Basically. I think, if you look at the 2016 season where we lost eight games, most of them were pretty close and most of them we had a lead in. Um, And we just, you know, when when things started not going our way, we just weren't able to 
um, brush that off, remain positive, remain focused on the mission and, and complete it. And I think in 2018, um, even though we went on a feed, we had some games that looked pretty close against teams that shouldn't have been. So you remember like the Pittsburgh game, for example, um, even Northwestern was kind of close. Uh, USC, we had to come from behind after the first half. So um, just kind of having that mindset of if things aren't going our way, uh, there are things that we can control to fix it. And it's not um, kind of like an overall sense of doom when the game looks bleak because um, that's kind of contagious on a sideline. Um, and then just also the overall sense of accountability that was – installed into our locker room after the 2016 season, um, you know, everybody understanding their role and how important it is that they um, not only meet the standard, but exceed the standard of expectations in fulfilling that role. And anybody who falls short is a detriment to the entire team. So we kind of had that, that idea um, all throughout 2018. And I think that's been ingrained in the culture now at Notre Dame and you can see it on the field this season so far. I'm sure you guys had high expectations going into that 2018 season because 2017 was a big improvement from the year before. But when did you realize that you guys were not just a good team, but you were capable of accomplishing something that was really special? Oh, man, I don't know if I have a single moment that I could pinpoint. Um, and that's kind of on purpose, I think, is that when you're playing a season, the coaches really put an effort to make sure that you're only thinking about one week at a time. Uh, so in a way, the, the time that we realized it was, you know, after we won our 12th game, but, um, you know, obviously beating Michigan week one was big. Um, and I think, I think the mindset of every guy on that team was pretty special in that. I don't think we ever went into a game thinking there was any chance that we were going to lose and not from like an arrogance standpoint, but, um, just, that was the mindset of like, we we're very confident. Um, you know, if the offense fell short, we're going on the sideline. Like, I know the defense is going to pick us up. And if the defense was on the sideline, like maybe the offense needs a score, like they felt pretty good about it. So we, we all just kind of had each other's backs. And um, so I think just in those little moments is, is what built us up to the point where we got to go to the playoff. But I don't know if I could really pick a specific moment where I was like, you know, oh, this team could do it. Well, from a fan's perspective, I can tell you the moment where I was like, oh, this team might be really good. And it was the Stanford game. Now, granted, Stanford ended up not being the top 10 team that they were at the time yeah. that you guys played them. But after that game, I was like, damn, this team could be pretty much everyone left on the schedule. They have a real shot at going undefeated. You said that you guys were always confident you were going to win. Where did that come from? Did that come from just all the training you guys did in the offseason? Or how was that developed uh, over the course of camp, into the season, and so on? Yeah, just a little bit of what I said, the the training that Coach Bayless puts through in the offseason, we, you know, we've done really hard things together already, and we've been doing it since January. Um, so just kind of having that confidence in the in the camaraderie of the team, knowing that we can go through hard things together and come out on the other side better for it. Um, and then, again, just the accountability aspect of I know – Khalid Kareem is going to do his job on this drive and it's going to help us out. And I know Chase Claypool is capable of making like a really big catch on this drive and it's going to help us out. And like, you know, and, and that inspires you to do better. Like if, if you can look in at the offensive line, like when you're lining up for a play, like, all right, I know like Trevor Rulon's going to bust his ass on this play. And that means that I got to do the same. It's, it's just kind of like an inspiring thing when everybody is firing on all cylinders. You said, that it already kind of feels like a special season. So are you seeing some of those qualities from that 2018 team and this year's team as well? Yeah, I think so. And, you know, I can't speak necessarily to it because I'm not there in the locker room, but um, the product they're putting out there on Saturdays looks great. Um, and, and now that I'm not on the team, I can look ahead at the schedule. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I, I feel good about our chances against Ohio State, feel good about – Clemson and then USC will be really tough. They look great this year, but, um, you know, I feel good about that. And um, I think that even with probably – like those are the three big games on the schedule, obviously. And I think even with one loss to those teams, there's a chance of the playoff depending on what shakes out everywhere else. I mean, that will be tough because usually, you know, like an SEC team will get in likely, whoever wins the championship there. Um, Texas kind of looks like they'll go undefeated. Um and then, you know, there's only two spots left after that. And if USC is undefeated and they beat us, not good for us. So winning all three, I mean, going 12 0, obviously Notre Dame's in, I would imagine. But um, I think even with one loss, there's a chance they get in. So uh, 
it just feels like it could be the year that that they win all the, all three of those big games and and have a, a really good chance in the semifinal. I know that the coaches would never say it, but I feel like they're probably doing a little prep for Ohio State this week, even though that Central Michigan is the game uh, coming this Saturday. Can you remember a time at all during your playing career where you guys were playing someone who wasn't that competitive and you had another big game soon where maybe you started to creep uh, into preparation for that game? Or was it was it always one week at a time throughout your entire career? Yeah, so the coaches do a pretty good job of keeping it rigid, like this is who we're playing this week. But you know for a fact in the background, like the grad assistants and analysts have been cutting up film for Ohio State, you know, basically since – March, January, whenever you want to say it. So, um, and things creep in like that. Like there's kind of the tone of, you know, we're playing central Michigan this week, but, um, probably in meeting rooms, there's been mention of things like this. We'll need this come big game, Ohio state, you know, that, but they keep it pretty focused on opponent week in week out. But, um, you know, I mean, everyone understands that Ohio state's a bigger game than central Michigan and it is hard to not look past the team. Um, and I think, I mean, you've seen it in teams that I was on, like we had close games with teams we shouldn't have. Like, I mean, 2018, even like ball state, like was kind of close, which was, it was pretty close. <laughs> yeah. Which, which was pretty stupid. Like it should never be like that. And, um, that's kind of the temptation is, um, going into a game like that. I think everyone, not, I can't speak for everyone, but I think sometimes the mindset is like, Oh, like let's, let's run it up this time. Like let's get all our stats in, let's blow it out. And then like, you know, get the walk-ons in and stuff. But, like, that happens step by step. That happens play by play and quarter by quarter. So um, I I believe that the coaching staff and the players are probably all focused pretty well on Central Michigan this week and just taking care of business and um, moving on to Ohio State after that. Everyone should be empowered to take care of themselves and their loved ones during the unexpected. That's why Jace Medical offers the Jace Case. The Jace Case provides five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use and gives you a peace of mind so that you are not just hoping that you have access to medication in an emergency. Jace Medical makes sure you have the medication in hand and is simple. They handle everything from the online evaluation to licensed pharmacy medication delivery and ongoing consultation and care. Don't get caught unprepared. Save more than $360 by getting these life-saving antibiotics with Jace Medical plus an additional $20 off by using code LOCKEDON at checkout on jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com, promo code LOCKEDON. Okay, I want to ask you about two guys playing your natural position in the slot. And let's start with Chris Tyree. He obviously made the move from running back to slot receiver for this season, and he's been excellent so far. He's already racked up six catches, 128 yards, and a touchdown. And frankly... He's made that transition look pretty easy, even though we know it's not easy at all. And I know it's not an apples-to-apples apples comparison, but you played for an option offense in high school before coming to Notre Dame, so you had to learn the position to an extent as well. How would you describe that process to give us a better sense of what Tyree had to go through this offseason? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's a lot of nuances in the position, um, a lot of finding space, a lot of variability in routes. Um, and I think that his skill set is kind of naturally sued to that. I mean, we've seen it in some of the, like in his long catch this past week, he had, you know, some creativity in the scramble drill and got open. Um, but it's a testament to how hard he's worked at it. I know. I, I think there's been some stories that the media put out about how many balls he was catching in the off season. And um, I went back for a week in the summer and like talked to him and, uh, I was, well, I was in the locker room. He came up to me. He's like, Hey, while you're here this week, can we please get some work in? And like, you teach me some stuff about slot, which is like, you know, that's an initiative from a guy who who wants to learn it. And not that I'm like the, the source of information on it, but I, you know, he's never done before. So I had some things I could teach him and he picked everything up really, really quickly. Um, he's got great coaches, great other receivers on the team and he's picking up really well. It's, it's, I'm really enjoying watching him play. And I think that, um, Hopefully his targets and opportunities will only go up as the season goes. Is there anything that you taught him that you saw him do on one of these games? And you're like, I taught him that. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I can't take credit for anything Chris is doing. Chris is doing all his own his own work. Um, but we, we kind of just talked about the mentality of like releasing off the line, second level releases, finding space. Um, just, you know, he'd never played receiver before. So just kind of um, talking through the ideas of, of what it, what it means to, run a good route and and things like that so again i, I i'm not going to say that i really like 
imparted a ton of wisdom on him. But I, it is just a testament to his desire to learn and his desire to put in the work to get better. And um, it's showing up, and I think it's going to continue to show up. Yeah, I wanted to give you an opportunity to hype up your coaching skills a little bit. But no. <laughs> behind Chris Tyree is true freshman Jane Greathouse, who is tied for the team lead in touchdown receptions this season with three. And he did not have to learn a new position. He was basically playing a college offense in high school, so he came in ready to go. From what you've seen, how how advanced is his de- development compared to what most true freshman wide receivers look like when they come in? Yeah, he looks fantastic. Um no hesitation out there, which is a testament to him learning the playbook and, and knowing where his spots are going to be. Um, and, I mean, it was first catch in college was a contested deep ball for a touchdown. I mean, that's something that is not normal for a freshman to, to be able to go up in traffic and, and make catches like that. He had a nice contested catch in the end zone against NC State. So um, I think the the kind of one two and the slot between Tyree and him, with Tyree being like the smaller, shiftier guy and him being um, a bigger target to throw to, I think they complement each other well, and they're both really capitalizing on their opportunities. And in the past, Notre Dame has not played a ton of true freshman wide receivers, and I think there's a bunch of different reasons for that. But you could speak to it better than I can. Like how how much does a typical freshmen have to learn once they get on campus maybe beyond just learning the place yeah um and like you said Jaden uh ran a complex offense in high school so that helps a lot um there's a bigger learning curve for me running triple option in high school so I had I felt like I had to really get over some some knowledge gaps but um I think the biggest thing for a freshman receiver is um So number one, you know, you're not going to be the starter most likely. So you're going to be, you're going to have to plug in in spots where guys need breaks um, or where they just want to see where your game fits. So that means you have to know, not just your position. You have to know all three wide receiver positions and likely the tight end position if they're going in different formations and there's all the motions and different kinds of stacks they can get into. So I think that's like the biggest thing for, for learning, um, as a freshman receiver is just knowing what everyone's doing on every play, knowing how you fit into it, understanding on a deep level that that helps because you're getting plugged in at boundary receiver, field receiver, slot receiver. Um, So there's that. And then just, I mean, it testament to Jaden that I think it can be daunting sometimes when guys come in and, you know, it's Notre Dame football and uh, that's, that's a, that's a big leap to make from high school football, but he's uh, he's not shying away from, from the the bright lights and he's making plays when they call his number. And I think that's just going to build his confidence and he'll never look back. So that's good. Yeah. With all these touchdowns under his belt already, he has every reason to be confident. Uh, Last question on the offense before uh, we change subjects. Jared Parker is in his first season as the full-time offensive coordinator and Notre Dame's offense is for the most part, been kind of clicking on all cylinders so far. Is there anything that you've seen from Notre Dame's offense schematically that's caught your eye or stands out to you that either maybe they weren't doing it before or just like, wow, that was a good design there against this specific defense? You know, not off the top of my head, any any specific like plays that I've noticed that stood out and watching on TV frustrates me because the, the angle is always like zoomed in on the box and the quarterbacks. You can't even see like the plays which is frustrating, but I'm, you know, so I'm sure he's dialing up some good stuff. I mean, obviously they're scoring a lot. Um, I don't know. I, I just like that they have a multitude of options that they can go to and that they do go to. Um, so, you know, on, on like a third down, the defense can't sit there and be like, all right, we're bracketing, um, you know, like Michael Mayer this time, like he, he, the ball yeah. is coming there. Like, no, it's like, it could go to Jaden. It could go to the other Jaden. It could go to Chris. It could be Audric. It could be Holden. Um, Mitchell, like all those guys are viable options. And, um, and Hartman's got, you know, this is six season, So he's really able to stand back there. And like I said, stay in the pocket and see options one, two, three, four, move around creativity. Like it's just, they have a lot of tools and they're using them well. Last year on third down, it almost felt like we didn't even really need signal callers on the sideline. We might as well have just held up a sign like it's going to Mayer. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really blame him either. The Michael Mayer. No, was I mean, it, it worked. Yeah, exactly. Like, a lot of people couldn't stop him, so that was good. But, but yeah, it does feel a little more um, well-rounded this year. All right, let's move to the defense for a bit here. Uh, when you were at Notre Dame, you had to go up against guys like Julian Love and Troy Pride every day in practice, two great college cornerbacks. And I'd argue – 
that the duo of Benjamin Morrison and Cam Hart is already at that level. And who knows how good Morrison can be considering he's only a sophomore. Uh, in your mind, what makes them so effective at shutting down the passing game? Yeah, they're studs. Um, I played with Cam. He was a young guy when I was on the team. He was receiver for a bit. Um, he just always had great athletic ability, and he was able to adapt from moving positions, um, see how long he is. And, you know, I think that – I mean, playing receiver, he has great ball skills. Um, he's big, physical, very strong. Um, Benjamin has great ball skills as well. You saw him track down that pick um, on the sideline. You know, I, I don't I, I don't know exactly what specifically makes them great, but they look confident out there. I feel like they go out there and don't think any receiver um, can give them problems. Uh, they're in the right place at the right time. They're aggressive. They, they, they just are a great duo back there. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Uh, I mentioned Love and Pride. Who won more one-on-one -on -one reps in practice when you went up against Julian Love and Troy Pride? Um, I I won more reps against – I'm not even – this isn't like I'm trying to brag or anything, but against all DBs, and that's kind of <laughs> the way – that's kind of the way it should be in one-on-ones. Um, like it's – it's set up for receivers to win. You have, you know, you have man-to-man -man coverage. You know the ball is coming to you, and there's no one else on the field, so you can, you know, you can win to any spot you want. Um, so it's really hard for the DBs, and you know, shout out to them for enduring that every day. Um, but you know, Julian was stronger than me, so I always had to worry about like not letting him get his hands on me. And if he did, it was tough for me to overcome it. Um, Troy was faster than me, so even if I created separation early, like I know he's going to close. So they both had a really good different skill sets that made it hard. Um, but I think if you ask any receiver anywhere, like who wins more one-on-one -on -one reps, it, it should be the receiver. I think you're just selling yourself short. I think you cooked him <laughs> and you're trying to be nice. <laughs> no, no, I, we, we trade off. It was, as they like to say, iron, iron sharpening iron. Everybody, everybody was very competitive, very good. So. All right, we've talked a lot about the big names, the stars of the team, but you've partnered with Fighting Irish Media this season for a new social segment that goes out every week on, on the official Notre Dame football accounts that spotlight some of the unsung heroes on the Notre Dame roster. So I'll give you the floor to talk about sort of how that came together and what you guys are doing with it each and every week. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's called Good Job. And uh, basically the premise of it is I find one play from the game um, and find uh, something small that someone did on the play that made it work that maybe the broadcast didn't highlight or you wouldn't know to look for. Um, and kind of just trying to shed light on things like that to help people better appreciate the game of football, um, see things in a new light, um, you know, kind of have a refreshing take on the game. And uh, the idea came from just having played football for so long. I know that there are a ton of plays when you get into the film room on like a Monday morning reviewing the game and um, you know, everybody in your meeting room and your coach, like something real little, they'd be like, Hey, that was a really good job. Like a little pat on the back type thing, but you know, nobody ever, nobody's ever going to notice it. And um, I don't know, I'm just trying to create a, uh, um, an opportunity for people to see what goes into the game of football, um, have a positive mindset of like appreciating all the little things um, and you know, football's an 11 man game. It usually doesn't work if all 11 aren't on the same page. And, um, usually if some guy makes a play, it's cause several other guys did something really well to open it up for him. Or then the coach called a good play. So everything has to work in unison. It's gotta be a concerted effort. And I'm just trying to highlight the guys who do the little things. Well, can you give us a sneak peek for who did a good job against NC state? Yeah, it's coming out, uh, tomorrow. So, um, we already talked about him, Chris Tyree in the slot, got a play from him, going to, going to talk about his creativity and his, uh, ability to adapt on the fly. Who are some of the other unsung heroes, uh, of this team that do all the right things, do all the dirty work that fans need to keep an eye out for on Saturdays? Yeah. The, uh, the number one answer for this at all times is the offensive line. Um, just the nature of the position is they're never going to, you know, with very, few exceptions are never going to score a touchdown. Uh, they're never going to get the ball. Um, usually even when they make like a fantastic highlight play, like a big pancake block, like probably people didn't see it because they're watching whoever has the ball. So those guys are always just, just by nature of their position, they're always getting the job done in a way that doesn't get, um, that doesn't always 
uh, get highlighted or noticed. Um, and then other than that, I would say it can be anybody on any play. I mean, there were uh, – I, I, first week we did a video on Holden Stays and a route he ran to free up Jaden Thomas. And then second week was um, J.D. Bertrand opening up a gap for Maris Leifau and Jordan Mattello to get a sack in. So it's really play-specific. Um, and I guess I would just encourage people when they show a replay of a big play, uh, maybe maybe put your eyes somewhere other than the ball carrier or the quarterback and see if you can find anything that, that looks impressive. I think it's fun to look for. It's a, it's a new way to – um, to watch football, I guess. And uh, I think it's fun. All right. That's a great note to end it on. Remember to check out Good Job. Comes out once a week on the official Notre Dame Football social accounts. And Chris, uh, thanks so much for coming on, man. This is a lot of fun, and I hope we can do it again soon. Yeah, thank you, Tyler. Looking forward to doing it again. College football season is here, and this season, the Locked On Podcast Network is kicking up our coverage with a new show called Locked On College Football Kickoff Live, which airs every Friday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern on every Locked On College YouTube channel. College Football Kickoff Live will cover everything going on in the sport and go in-depth like only Locked On can, including insight and analysis from our stable of college hosts covering their team every day. Today's episode is also brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for all the fun you'll have. If you're planning on going to the game against Central Michigan on Saturday but don't have tickets yet, Game Time can help you out. It's the fastest-growing ticketing app in the country for a reason, and you can get images of your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. Buy tickets in a matter of seconds, just two taps and you're set, and the tickets are sent directly to your phone so you never have to dig through your email. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again. Create an account and redeem code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. All right, that's a wrap for this episode of Locked On Iris. This is your reminder to get your questions in. If you want to be featured on tomorrow's mailbag episode, you can tweet them to at Locked On Irish or slide in the Instagram DMs at Locked On Irish Pod. And please subscribe to the show if you have not already. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.